right. So first of all, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And my virtual background is a little bit messed up. Bear with me. Um, oof. Um, so I, I have the uh, the misfortune of coming after Dave and Barbara. So uh, that's, those are tough acts to follow. I nevertheless hope that you will find my presentation riveting. So first of all, what is RIVET? Um, RIVET stands for Robust Independent Validation of Experiment and Theory. And here I have a flow diagram where you can see what um, how this works. So there is a standard output format for many Monte Carlo models, including most um, models in heavy ion collisions. And this format is called HEPMC. You guys learned how to generate this from, uh, from Jetscape earlier in the week. Um, and it, it turns out that actually most Monte Carlo models in heavy ion physics generate HEPMC. And some of them for the EIC, it's still in development. We still have a few um, bugs to, to work out, um, but that is underway and we're making um, big developments. Um, Rivet takes that format as an input so that if you want to compare to multiple different models, you only have to write one analysis code. Um, and the other thing that it does is that it pulls from this database called HEP data, and it pulls the data there so that you get, um, by running Rivet over your Monte Carlo, you get nice neat plots showing the data shown here in black and the model shown here in red, um, all for writing one, one piece of analysis code. And in 2014, there was an agreement by a sub, with a subset of people from the field that we should adopt Rivet and start using it because it's a really great tool that comes originally from particle physics. Um, however, we only had the first um, release of Rivet that was fully capable of heavy ion collisions. The essential component was that it needed to be able to address centrality in June 2019. Um, so that means that it's relatively recent that uh, we've been able to use it for heavy ion collisions. So why should you use Rivet? It facilitates comparisons between Monte Carlos and data. Um, the second reason is that it's actually not that hard to, to use. So I'm going to show you some, uh, some inform give you some information about stuff that I've been doing with undergraduates. Um, and the, um, the third thing is that it preserves analysis details. So um, often when we've been going back and trying to implement um, analyses from published papers, we've run into issues where it turns out no one really knows the exact right answer. And that's a problem because some of these details really matter for making um, valid comparisons between data and Monte Carlo. Um, and finally, you can really treat the Monte Carlo exactly like data. And this means that any subtle issues that um, might not be where we might not fully understand them when we do the measurement, um, if at least in the limiting case that the model is exactly right, the comparison between data and the model should be, should be valid. Um, so what are the steps in implementing an analysis in Rivet? The first thing is that you have to format the data for HEP data if it's not in HEP data, um, or sometimes you have to fix um, you have to fix the HEP data if to make it Rivet compatible if um, if it has a few issues that um, that Rivet doesn't work well with. Um, if you need to do that, um, we have a short tutorial here, so about 13 minutes. Um, that's just enough to to deal with a um, new paper and then a long tutorial um, that is much more in depth um, in case the, the shorter one is not enough. Um, the second thing is that you install Rivet um, or load it on an existing farm. So there's a live link in the slide here so you can get instructions and Rivet is already on RCF and, a and um, LX Plus. So you don't have to install it if you're an experimentalist and can just use those. Um, and then we have Rivet tutorials that walk you through how to do each of the steps in the analysis with slides and recordings from this workshop on rivetizing heavy ion collisions at RIC. Um, and it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward. So actually here you can see a plot that was done um, by my undergraduate this summer, Justin, 
Um, and it shows, it, we, this is still low statistics, we have to build up statistics, but what you see here in black is the data and in red is what we get with Jetscape after running um, proton-proton collisions. Um, Justin wrote the rivet analysis this summer, we're working on getting it approved so it can officially be in the rivet repository. Um, and then he first learned how to run Jetscape with the rest of you at this school last Monday. Um, so a benefit of running rivet is that you can, um, you can get, as soon as you can generate a HEP MC, if there are rivet analyses already in the library, you can just run your Monte Carlo model over, uh, run rivet over your Monte Carlo model. Um, and you know, Justin is doing the thing most relevant to this workshop, but I do want to acknowledge my other undergraduates um, who are just working on, have the misfortune of working on different projects with me, but are also awesome. Okay, so what does it take to get everybody doing this? The first is the experiments need to have a validation procedure to get the analyses um, public and approved. Um, the LHC experiments do, but the RIC experiments do not. Um, I won't go into that further. We also have a few outstanding issues with Monte Carlo models um, that I'm gonna to touch on. Um, you can use the HEPMC output, but you have to be aware of these issues to make sure that you're using it correctly. Um, and we're, we're working on beating these down as well. Um, a third one is that it's really, really useful when you're writing uh, an analysis to define primary particles and have the experiment verify that this is the definition of primary particles. Um, lastly, specifically for jets, you need to deal with the background in models if you're looking at a model that simulates the full event. Um, and we also need to get a critical mass of heavy ion analyses so that people really start using this. So what is the status of heavy ion Monte Carlos? Um, I am going to, so this is mostly for reference. Um, there are really, so all, most heavy ion generators make hep -MC output, um, but many of them have a couple common problems. Um, so it turns out that the hep -MC format assumes that you can track the parentage of a particle uh, from the incoming beam all the way to the final state particle, but that doesn't make so much sense when you are working with, um, with a hydrodynamic fluid. So many of the generators don't have all of the information about the case, but usually include information about just the final state particles. Um, the other approach is that they include the, um, the particles, um, they include some particles, but not their decays. So um, right now in the current version of Jetscape, if you want to look uh, if you look for pi zeros, you only see their decay daughters. So only the, um, the particles circled up here in blue are in the output. Um, so you would not be able to use Jetscape out of the box with the, um, with the HEPMC format to look at the pi zero. Um, we are working on that, but it's gonna take some time. That's not less of a problem if you're talking about reconstructed jets. Um, another issue is the status of beams and the way that beams are kept track of in the HEPMC. Um, you may need to run with options to ignore the beams um, because the information about beams is not in the HEPMC output for most heavy ion Monte Carlo generators. Um, and we, we did have a half a day workshop shop to try to get theorists on board with the solutions for this, but that was in June and it takes a while to get everything deployed. Um, okay, primary particles. So experimentally, we think of prime, we go, well, what is a primary particle? It's a particle that looks like it's coming from the interaction vertex. Um, but on the, it turns out that it's a little bit tricky to figure out um, on a theoretical level when you're dealing with um, particles by particle type, what, uh, how you should classify it. So what's really helpful when you're writing a rivet analysis is to have a definition of primary particles in rivet um, that is, so that you, when you're writing an analysis, you don't have to redefine it every time. 
Um, the Elise collaboration pioneered this and has a, a projection in Rivet, which is like a method. Um, we're trying to get the other collaborations to adopt this. This is important also because sometimes, well, it, it, there can be very subtle differences between different experiments or not so subtle differences, such as the protons um, from in, in Phoenix. Phoenix does feed down corrections for the protons due to the lambda, but star does not. Um, so, you, you know, if you have a rivet projection, the, the theorists do not need to dig through the experimental papers to figure out what each experiment does. Um, they can use the rivet analysis to make valid comparisons. And sometimes the definition even changes from paper to paper, which is also an argument for, um, for getting rivet analyses implemented so we can make valid comparisons between data and monocarbons. Okay, so background for jet analyses. Um, I think we're used to thinking about background as an experimental problem, but actually background is also a theoretical problem. If you are working with a Monte Carlo model that simulates the entire event, because if you're working with this type of model, um, then you have particles in your final state which are not um, related to jet production. So here you can see uh, the background den energy density from uh, Elise as a function of the charged particle multiplicity. Here you can see the same thing in Pythia Angantir as a, again, as a function of charged particle multiplicity. And um, the, the real point I want to make here is that even though this is a Monte Carlo model, you also have background um, for your jet measurements. So how should we approach this? I think we should go with the same philosophical approach that we have with the Snowmass Accord, which said that if you that you to make valid comparisons between data and and your model, you should do apply exactly the same technique to data and to your model. Um, and Rivet has much the same philosophy that whatever you did in your analysis, you should do the same thing in your analysis as you do in data, and then the two are comparable. So how does this work when we talk about jets? and a Monte Carlo model that has background. Well, here's a schematic diagram showing the different steps in an experimental analysis. You take your tracks or clusters, feed them into a jet finding algorithm. You will get jet candidates, and every single particle is clustered into a jet candidate. You have to do background subtraction. Um, excuse me. Uh, so you do your background subtraction. Um, you get a raw spectrum. And then you unfold using a response matrix. So this is going to correct for the smearing due to all sorts of experimental effects, as well as background fluctuations. And this is how you get your corrected spectra. If you apply this to a Monte Carlo model, um, in the steps, what changes is that your input is particles rather than, uh, than tracks and calorimeter clusters but you still go through a jet finding algorithm, you get jet candidates and you do background subtraction exactly like you do in the experiment. This will also ensure that any subtle effects of the background subtraction are included in your model calculation so that the two are valid. Um, you get uh, raw spectra. So here I just cheated and used the same plot from the experiment because I don't have a good one from data. And then you do unfolding. And here you see the response matrix that we got um, in Pythia Angantir, this includes background fluctuations, but also perhaps any other effects that are that have to do with subtle definitions of your measurement. And ask, so you have to still do unfolding even on the Monte Carlo model, because that is exactly how you treat the data and exactly how you would correct for these fluctuations in the data. Um, and we did a closure test, and here you can see the unfolded answer over the, the truth. So what we did is that we mixed a Pythia in event in with a heavy ion event, and we um, made sure that we added the same number of jets um, as we had the same, as many extra jets from the, as we had in, in the Pythia event. Um, and then the different methods, one method was to use the um, delta PT method used by Elise to measure the fluctuations and use that to get the response matrix. And the other um, was to do full embedding where we mix a Pythia event into the, um, 
into the heavy ion event and then do unfolding to, and um, therefore it's really treating it exactly like the um, like we treated the, the data. And what you see is that you actually need to use the embedding um, because only the embedding leads to full closure. So you can't just take into account the fluctuations. Um, and we are working on making information about this public so others can use it. Um, so then you have two different approaches depending on the type of Monte Carlo model you have. Um, so you can, with a full Monte Carlo model, meaning that you're simulating the whole event, you get your HEPMC output, you feed it into rivet. After that, you have to um, unfold the correct for fluctuations in order to compare to the data. Um, but if you have a model that only has the signal, you can skip the unfolding step. Now, a note about this, there are ambiguities in which particles should be called signals. So if you use a signal only model such as Joule, you are also um, inheriting any of the mistakes or ambiguities in the definition of what belongs in, the, in with the signal. Um, so I think this is the gold standard. If you have a full Monte Carlo, you really can completely treat it exactly like data. So how do you get a lot of rivet analyses done? Um, I mentioned that we had only had a fully functional, a version of rivet, which was fully functional for heavy ion collisions in 2019. Um, and we had a lot of, have a lot of papers and very important papers from before then. Um, the answer that we've adopted at UT um, is undergraduates. So undergraduates are approximately free and available in near infinite supply. So if you can get something, if you can get them to do this, um, it is both educational and a good way to get a lot of analyses done. Um, so what I've been doing for the last four semesters is something called a course-based undergraduate research experience. Um, and I have students enroll in a class and at the end of the semester, they have a nearly functional um, rivet analysis, although it only really worked well the last couple semesters. Um, there's also a lot of pedagogical reasons uh, for doing this. So we know that early engagement in research increases graduation rates and completion of degrees uh, in the sciences. Um, it also increases the diversity of your classes. Uh, what, what you're doing is lowering, lowering the threshold for participation in research. So in the standard approach, um, students have to approach a professor and ask them to take them on. And that can be very intimidating for students, especially students who don't otherwise feel comfortable in a university environment. Um, and the, the other thing is that this gives them a defined amount of work that they are committing to. Um, so I found that my non, many of our non-traditional students who have commitments outside of school are more comfortable signing up for a course-based research experience because they know what they're getting in, in for. Um, so here you can see numbers from um, the students we've had working on Rivet at UT. So in the four semesters of having the class, about half of our students, half of my students have been women, and about a quarter have identified as something other than white. Um, and I've had three non-traditional students. So in comparison, our um, university, our, our physics major is about 25 to 30 percent female. So this is an overrepresentation of, uh, of women. And I want to say about 20% identifying as non-white. Um, so this is an overrepresentation, um, which is good. What we're seeing is that, that students from underrepresented groups are more likely to engage in this research if it's, if it's easy. Um, and so this gives me my undergraduate army. Um, some other fun details. Uh, since the, our, of our graduates since summer 2019, um, we've had about a third of UT undergraduates somehow participating in formatting, um, in, in writing rivet analyses, including about 40% of our women and about 50% of our students who identify as something other than white. Um, here is a whole bunch of resources. Um, if you are interested in either implementing a rivet analysis yourself, 
um, or especially if you're interested in course-based undergraduate research experience. Um, so we have our draft analyses on GitHub. Um, contact me if you'd like to use them so I can tell you what this real state of that analysis is. We're working on getting them approved. Um, all sorts of resources on this course-based undergraduate re research experience and some information on specifically implementing Rivet. And please contact me. I would love to help you get Rivet working. So in conclusion, Rivet is, if not easy, it's relatively straightforward and it allows comparisons to multiple different models. Um, you write one piece of code and you can compare to many different things. And there's lots of resources available. And I would like to specifically acknowledge, especially Antonio De Silva, my postdoc, and Crystal Martin, um, my brand spanking new graduate student, um, who was in fact one of the undergraduates who worked with me on Rivet. Um, and you know, I've got my list of undergraduates this summer right here. Um, all right, thank you. Well, thank you uh, for staying on time. So, uh, let me see whether we do we have any questions nothing on slack okay and there is a question from lauren uh casper and do you want just to uh unmute yourself and ask this question yourself yeah i can do that can you hear me yeah, yeah. hi christine um so you mentioned on your um hep mc compatibility slide that you can't study like pi zeros out of the box with Rivet due to the, the daughter decay issue. But if you want to do a study on reconstructed, reconstructed jets, this is less of a problem with a study like that. Can you just go into more detail about it? Yeah, first, um, this is not an issue if you don't use the hep MC. So you can do something independent of Rivet. If you're using Rivet, you're using the HEPMC output. Um, we're trying to figure out the right approach to fix this. Um, and I hope we can figure it out soon. Um, but uh, even if we do, it's going to take a while to, to issue a release that has that um, implemented. Um, if you are using JET that you know, what we call, so I, it should work currently because the, the lambda and the K0 short are not decayed either. So if you're using um, what we call full jets in a lease, meaning that you're using all of the particles, it doesn't, it shouldn't, whether or not you are clustering the pion daughters or the pion itself should make a very small difference. Um, almost nothing. Um, at the edges, it might be like a tenth of a percent effect. Um, if you are using charged jets, such as what Elise does, it also should be okay because the charged final the charged final state particles are fine. The issue is that right now you can't access what's called unstable particles, and the pi zero is an unstable particle. And I would like to add uh, to that that you know historically I think part of the issue came up that in Monte Carlo's like UMD, particles the decays of which are not strong decays but weak decays have been considered as stable particles like so a pi zero was a stable particle you know or a lambda or a sigma or uh, hyperons are considered stable particles. And so uh, that is, of course, not true if you look at what, what happens in the experiments. Uh, but that added, so to speak, an extra step where you had a mismatch between what the theory sort of has in its models and what the experiment needs. And the rivet, in prin rivet and HEPMC, in principle, if you have everything filled out correctly, on um, when you're writing a rivet analysis, you can select the right particles. It's just that very few heavy ion Monte Carlo models currently conform to the standards, which is why we had this half day workshop to try to get, get things sorted out. 
I see uh, Dave has a question. Yeah, I have a quick question for you, Christine. So do I understand right? I mean, Rivet is um, generally useful for automating analyses. It's not specifically necessary that it uh, deal with Monte Carlo data. Is that c correct? And I am not a, I, you would have to put your experimental data in a HEPMC format, which I don't think you can do. I see. Okay. So it really is focused on, on the, the Monte Carlo generated data and, oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Well, I actually, I do, I also have a question here. This is just a um uh, when you give a talk actually uh, during the, um, the INT meeting. Uh, so many, many theoretical models, they don't have uh, the final hardenization yet, uh, but that still is okay if, if you do JIT analysis, because uh, if you only look at the energy depo deposition in your detector, uh, there is a very difference between you use hard on or versus part on. And, but in this case, can, 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 with the model with the, without hardenization, can they still do use this very? I think the short answer is no, um, because it happens to if your happen to is written, well, it, in the HEPMC file, you have the type of particle. And so if I want to, um, if I'm implementing a jet analysis, I can ask for all, if I use say the least primary particle projection, if even if you called in your model, if you called a gluon, a final state particle, it would, um, it would not have the right particle type. So you would not see any particles to feed into your jet finder. Mm -hmm. um, you would have to take that um, that model and have some hadronization afterburner so that you get final state hadrons. Although I no. would argue that if the radii, jet radii that we usually measure, which is usually point two, but maybe most measurements aren't much more than point four you are sensitive to hadronization anyway. Well, I think uh, some, uh, some people actually, even we even want some experimentalists when they do like Monte Carlo, in this case, they just uh, uh, assume like each individual cell in a parameter and become a massless particle. The problem is uh, whether you have some kind of uh, particle ID in that in that package that you know is massless, but it's actually not is considered. If I, when you do especially jet recon, reconstruction, it really does not really really matter whether the, the it has mass or not, right? Yeah. So some of that really, what you do is you kick it into the rivet analysis. So um, one of my students when implementing a an analysis in a calorimeter that had coarse granularity actually wrote um, something that that clusters the particles as they would look for the calorimeter to emulate the granularity you'd have in a calorimeter. Yeah. And the thing that I like about Rivet is that if you have any of these subtle issues, you can put it into the Rivet analysis and you should. So when we had the first, the preliminary ZG measurement, where it turned out that there was an experimental cut to avoid two particles that were too close together, um, and the experimentalists thought, oh, that doesn't matter at all, and we think we have a correction for it, but it turned out to make a humongous difference in the proper interpretation of the measurement. If you had a rivet analysis that properly had that implemented, it, at least the theory and the model comparison would have been valid. Yeah, I, I thought it would be very helpful for many theorists if there is some kind of way 
uh, to provide just pollen information and then and then do all the you know gear reconstruction, background subtraction stuff like in Revit. Yes, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, and without without going through the harmonization because harmonization is really you know it's really complicated and then and for to for gear reconstruction, it's not you know the error is different difference is very small. I think there's not currently a way that you could do it without jet reconstruct or sorry without hadronization. Um, I'm not convinced that we should, but that's maybe a longer discussion. Yeah, well, maybe you can, you know, ask some of your students to work on a, you know, some kind of version <laughs> that, that does not require hadrons too. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. So any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I would just make a comment uh, and say that uh, if you don't have hadronization, the best way to get it is to put your model in Jetscape where you will get hadronization for free. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Very good, okay. So uh, let's thank uh, Christine and all, and, and also Dave and Barbara for all the talk today. And uh, finally, I think this is uh, coming, the school is come to an end and we have a concluding remark from Abhijit. Abhijit, you are muted. Right, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, so let me just quickly share the screen before everybody runs away.